Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the James D. Julia Auction House taking a look at some of the guns that they have coming up for sale in their next auction. There's some really cool stuff in here too. This one in particular that I found in the catalog is it's an 1849 Colt uh, 30, 31 caliber pocket revolver. What makes it very interesting is that it was sold, or has been equipped with, a Thur cartridge conversion. These were patented in 1868 by a man named F. Alexander Thur. Um, and they're pretty much the first cartridge conversion that was available directly from Colt. Uh, they did sell these on factory-made guns, but they're not really that good of a cartridge conversion. So we'll take a look in just a moment at, at the internals of this up close to see how it works. But not many of them survived. Frankly, not that many were made in the first place. Um, Flaterman and most sources say it was about 5,000, but there's some folks who say it was actually a lot less than that. Um, regardless, not very many of them have survived to the present day. So I definitely wanted to take the opportunity to get a close look at this one. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and bring the camera back and take a look at just how this thing works. All right, so I've got our Colt here completely disassembled. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the nice things about this conversion is that it didn't require any modification to the frame or the barrel of the gun. So you could just drop in a regular percussion cylinder at any time. And frankly, I think a lot of people probably ran one or two cylinder loads of uh, Thur ammunition through it and then did exactly that. Because this is kind of a bit of a kludge of a conversion. Now, to be fair, it was one of the very first. And the big deal was that when this conversion was made, Rollin White's patent was still in place. And so this conversion couldn't violate that patent. So what it did instead was use a front loading cartridge. It looked very much like a, a modern center fire cartridge, except that it had no rim of any sort and it was just slightly tapered. You can't really see the taper here, but it was tapered. What you would do is load cartridges from the front of the cylinder down in, so their firing, their uh, primers, would be visible in the, the center of the cylinders here. And then the real heart of the conversion is this ring. They milled off the back of the cylinder so that this ring would fit on, like so. And then what this ring did was give you a firing pin camera to focus in here. So you have a firing pin right here. The one on the left is a firing pin. The one on the right is actually kind of like a snap cap. If we take a look on the back, you can see the firing pin here. It's not spring loaded. It doesn't really need to be. It's got a tiny amount of mass to it. And that's what would actually, the hammer would hit this, and then that firing pin would hit the primer of the cartridge and set it off. Now, our snap cap spot right here is connected to this flat leaf spring. So it moves just a little bit, really not much at all, but it's enough to absorb the impact of the hammer, uh, absorb the force and not break anything. Now you can see that there is a leaf spring in here connected to this little finger. We'll see what that does when we put the whole gun together. But that's, that's the heart of the conversion right there. This did require a set of tools to load and unload um, in order to prevent the cases from moving forward under recoil. They had to kind of be pressed into place a bit tightly here since they didn't have any sort of rim on the back that would hold them in place like a modern cartridge revolver. So let's go ahead and put this back together. This finger spring sits on one side of the frame, and then we have this stop right there on the other side of the frame. Once that's in place, our barrel goes on, just like a typical Colt. Our wedge goes through. So here's the gun fully assembled. We have regular cartridge stops on the cylinder. And then, now you can see that in normal use, the firing pin sits right under the hammer. So when you pull the trigger, the hammer falls, hits the firing pin, transmits the force onto the, the, cartridge of the, prim the primer of the cartridge, sets it off, fires it. When you recock the hammer, the cylinder rotates, but this back plate does not. 
that puts a new cartridge under your firing pin. You're ready to go again. Now, should you want to carry the gun, you can load all six chambers, and then you grab this thumb piece and pull the, the backing plate over to the left. You can see here that little finger spring is what provides the force for this to spring back when I let go of it. What I do with that is cock it, or is rotate it over to the left until I'm past that stop. Now I let the hammer down on what is basically a snap cap. So I can have all six chambers loaded and I can safely carry it hammer down now because there is no firing pin. The firing pin is sitting over here out of line with the hammer. So there's no way for an impact on the back of the hammer to actually set off a cartridge. Because of this little finger spring that's under tension down there, when I cock the hammer, you can see that the backing plate immediately snaps back into its firing position. So that's the one nice thing about the Thur conversion, is it did have a very good, very positive, and pretty much foolproof safety. Um, the bad side of the Thur conversion was pretty much everything else. Um, the cartridges did tend to slide forward under recoil, even though they were uh, slightly tapered. Um, it suffered from some accuracy issues because uh, as a result of the taper, the bullet didn't actually contact uh, the very front of the cylinder. So it had this little bit of free travel from when it left the cartridge case to when it actually entered the forcing cone where it was not in contact with anything. Uh, in a, a modern or any other typical revolver, it would at least be in contact with the, the wall of the chamber, but because these were tapered, the bullets were actually smaller than the mouth of the chamber. So that didn't really help things. Uh, the Army did test these and reject them for a number of reasons. Basically, the gist of it was they weren't as good as the Smith & Wesson pistols of the era, which makes sense because Smith & Wesson was able to actually use the board through cylinder um, because they had an exclusive licensing rights to Rollin White's patent. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, if you would like to purchase this pistol yourself, it will be up for sale in uh, the James Julia auction in March of 2015. So there's a link below to the catalog. This is lot number 1322. Go take a look at. They have a, their description and their high-res photos, of course. And, and sign up and place a bid online or plans to come down here in person and check out the auction. Thanks for watching.